First time in Iceland, obviously. And uh, it was 75 degrees and sunny when I left Vegas. And my shorts and a t-shirt, and I landed here, and this is what I got. <laughs> my goal is not to make this some sort of complicated, scientific, you know, pretend I'm a smart guy kind of seminar. My goal is to try and get you some takeaways, things you can apply immediately to your training. This is a program, I've kind of outlined a program that I would give to Hofthor uh, that detailed all the things I wanted him to pay attention to, kind of a prescription for nutrition, uh, you know, training and sleep. Take your jacket off real quick. Oh, you got your mic on. I want to see the, and then turn around and show them the back of your shirt. This is the to-do list. This is it. This is all you need to do. Train, eat, and rest, sleep. And that's all I focus on. I don't have anything more complicated than that. I just try and get you to optimize every one of those areas and pay attention to all the details that go into making all of those things better because then your training's better. All you do in the gym is break down muscle tissue. We don't build any muscle in here. We lift weights, we break it down. That's the fun part. That's the easy part in my mind. In order to make that effective, in order to make every workout great and to get stronger and bigger and faster, you have to eat, sleep, and train. Uh, and the, the best part about this is, is that the more uh, these little tips and tricks you apply, the more disciplined you are, the stronger you get. Now everything that we talk about affects hormones ultimately, and that's where uh, a huge benefit can be had. If by sleeping better you can improve hormones, if by eating better you can improve hormones, if by training optimally you can improve hormones, then you're going to get better results. And whether that's as a natural athlete or using performance enhancing drugs, it doesn't matter. You still have to optimize hormones because if you're deficient in a hormone, your performance is gonna suffer. If you're low in testosterone, you're not gonna gain muscle. If your thyroid is slow, you're not gonna burn fat. And we're trying to optimize that. And that was the first thing that Hofthor and I worked on together, was trying to make sure that we understood what to optimize his hormones. And when you're uh, just eating anything and everything and maybe missing some sleep or maybe overtraining, then those hormones start to get negatively affected and then your performance stops and then injuries start to occur uh, and you start putting on more fat than muscle and the whole thing just starts to, to, to crater. So I've kind of tagged my, uh, my diet information as the vertical diet and talking about how the vertical diet affects and peak performance. And everybody's kind of heard about it as the meat and rice diet. And I'm okay with that. That's really the prime, where the primary benefits come from. And there's a reason for that, and we'll go through it today. But it's, it, it's based on uh, a, hor a horizontal program that creates a foundation of things that are really important that you want to pay attention to when you're eating. And so we'll go through a lot of that stuff today. First, most important thing, I always talk about it first, is sleep. And you have to optimize sleep because it affects so many things that improve or uh, make your, your training suffer. There's some great research out there. Uh, sleep loss limits fat loss. When you lose sleep, a lot of things happen hormonally. Uh, there's some great research that shows that uh, you're gonna, your insulin resistance will increase. So if you start losing sleep, you become more likely to gain fat and less likely to put on muscle. The insulin resistance is important because the food that you eat is gonna be either preferentially shuttled towards uh, building muscle or it can be uh, shuttled towards putting on more fat and insulin resistance determines that and the more we can improve insulin resistance uh, or insulin sensitivity then the more we can the better re result we're going to get from the foods we eat the proteins in particular uh, but also the carbohydrates are those being used for energy and muscle glycogen or are those being stored as fat because you're missing sleep and your metabolism starts to slow down so insulin is a really important part of this equation and I measure that, and we'll talk about it later, in blood tests, we looked at Hofdor's hemoglobin A1C, which is the historical measurement of your blood sugars and how well, how efficiently your body is processing sugars and releasing insulin as a result. And we need to optimize that for best performance. When you uh, lose sleep, you increase blood pressure, which is obviously a, a negative effect. You also increase ghrelin, think hunger. So people who lose a lot of sleep tend to gain weight. They tend to eat more and have more insulin resistance, and so their body's just gaining fat, primarily. 
uh, increases cortisol. And we all know that that breaks down muscle tissue. So that's a, a bad place to be. It uh, decreases metabolism. So your metabolism actually slows as a result of losing sleep. <clears throat> it decreases testosterone. It's another huge factor. It decreases thyroid function, which is directly affected, you know, affects your metabolism. And here's, uh, this isn't me, I didn't invent this stuff, I didn't create it. There's, the great thing about this industry now is there's so many professionals that are involved in the sport that, you know, these brainiac PhDs that are applying their knowledge to sports performance. And uh, this Dr. Charles Schessler, he, uh, he coaches athletes on sleep and he works with a lot of professional athletes uh, from NBA, NHL, NFL. Now these, these people go and consult with these doctors and every time they'll recommend uh, a nap or a s more sleep instead of practice. It's particularly for people who travel, athletes who travel. So uh, it's not just me saying it's important, it's a huge priority. So how do we improve that? And that's where it comes down to proper sleep hygiene. Here's things you can do today to make sure that your sleep improves. And a list of those things is pay attention to your circadian rhythms. The body wants to sleep between say 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. or 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. That's optimal and you can't uh, change that. People who work a night shift and sleep days are always running at a deficit. They'll constantly be at a sleep deficit. And you can't really do anything about it. Now if that's what your situation is, that's what it is. And you have to do everything you can to optimize that. But if the opportunity presents itself, this is the best time. Not 1 a.m., but between 10 and 11. You're gonna get more sleep, better sleep, and it's not just about the amount, it's about the quality. So seven to nine hours seems to be the range. The more you train, the harder you train, the more muscle mass you carry, obviously you're gonna need more sleep. If you're training two a days or if you're getting ready for a competition, you should be closer to nine hours. And sedentary people might be able to get away with seven or somewhat uh, before that. Again, re relative circadian rhythms, every hour you get to, to bed before midnight is like two hours in the bank. So op optimize that, try and get yourself set up to your, your regularly getting to sleep at, at 10 or 11 o'clock at the latest. Doctors will tell you the best way to set this program up, because your circadian rhythms, you can kind of uh, establish how sleepy you are at night and what time you go to bed by what time you get up in the morning. So ideally, when you kick off this program, try and start to wake up at the same time every morning. Now, if you stay up late on a Friday or Saturday night and wake up late on a Saturday or Sunday morning, it is going to have an effect on your training. And so it's ideal that you do this consistently. Trying to recover from bad night's sleep might take you 48 hours. You're losing two days of optimal recovery. And that's a huge deal. One of the problems that Hawthorne's experienced is his travel schedule. Often puts him in a position to where he's uh, got jet lag or he's getting to bed late or missing hours of sleep. And so we try to optimize that. Part of his program, I talked to his manager and I asked him, hey, if he has to stay an extra night, get him there a day early so he can travel during the day and not have to land at midnight or one o'clock in the morning and then have to you know, forage for food at 2 a.m. That kind of thing's not optimal. So a lot of this, uh, the programming that I do is about logistics. It's just about trying to optimize all these things and, and plan ahead with meal preparation, travel time, what time you wake up, what time you sleep. And these things will drastically improve performance. These are some of the things that I paid the most attention to when I was training was things outside the gym. Even in college, I was in bed at 10 o'clock. I didn't party, all my friends knew that, that my chariot turned into a pumpkin at 10 p.m. and I was getting ready for bed. And that was it, and it was seven nights a week. It was boring, but it was effective. And that's why I did it. So some of the things that go along with this and toward optimizing your sleep is make sure you've got a pitch black room. I've got blackout lines at home so that when I shut things down, it's pitch black. I turn off all the electronics, I don't have any lights. My daughter likes having a night light in and I fight her all the time, I gotta take it out. And so, you know, since she's scared, it's dark. So I got to work with that, but a lights, what they do is, is they prevent your melatonin from being released. And so that affects optimum sleep. And if uh, even just having like the sunlight or the moonlight coming through and touching your skin, even if your eyes are closed, your body knows uh, about that light and it can, uh, it can uh, have an effect on the quality of your sleep. Uh, no electronics, I think a lot of this is heard now. If you're looking at your iPhone or your TV right before bed, that's preventing your, your, that's affecting your circadian rhythms and your body, uh, your melatonin isn't being released. And so uh, it's hard for your body to, to get set, to get shut down and go to sleep on time. So optimize that by trying to get away from your electronics about an hour before bed and dim the lights and start to get yourself set up. Conversely, when you wake up in the morning, it's optimal to have a lot of light. And that might not always be possible depending on the season, 
but optimally you would you would get the blinds open and be exposed to light i always right after breakfast i go out and do my walk in the morning and it's sunlight out that's how this whole thing starts it starts when you wake up in the morning and how much light you get a lot of times in environments where it's dark alaska seattle where i lived for a long time here uh, it's really important uh, some folks get a lot of benefit from doing light therapy. You've probably heard about, about that. There's probably a lot of that here. Uh, and that would be good to get some sort of lighting that, that uh, possibly affects your circadian rhythms. Uh, you know, I don't know the specifics on that, but there is a light therapy that I'll you know, have to do some more research to get the information. I've never had to use it, you know, because... Uh, yeah. <laughs> And the big one, vitamin D3. And everybody who's watched my stuff has heard me talk a lot about this. This helps in setting circadian rhythms. It's important for a lot more things, including immunity, um, uh, insulin sensitivity. It's gonna be a huge uh, part of my program is always optimizing vitamin D. That kind of brings us to this article here on the big vitamin D mistake. There was an uh, article that came out, I think it was out of Sweden, and uh, they found that there was a, the formula for calculating how much vitamin D you made was somehow um, misrepresented and they didn't realize how much you actually needed. The recommendation is that you get in 8,000 IUs of vitamin D a day. That's enough to keep about 90% of the population in a safe range. 8,000 IUs, it sounds like a lot, but it turns out that that's an effective dose. And anything less than that, you start potentially compromising the benefits of, of these circadian rhythm benefits, the insulin sensitivity, the immune system benefits. Uh, in a climate like this, it's estimated that more than 75% of people are, are probably vitamin D deficient. And this is a huge thing. It's one of the first things I put into a program. We did blood tests with Hofthor. I do blood tests all the time. If you have the opportunity to do that, we're going to talk about it a little later, but I strongly recommend it. Vitamin D is one of the things we test on the blood test and make sure to optimize. And a lot of the athletes that I've worked with, from Dan Green to Brian Shaw to Larry Wheels, they were all vitamin D deficient. And when they started taking vitamin D, their performance started to improve. Their sleep got better. Uh, their immune system, Hofthor and I talked about this last night, I haven't had a cold in over two years since I've really been uh, steady on optimizing vitamin D and, and increasing my sodium, which we'll talk about later. But even if you do get a cold, uh, it's, it's shorter in duration and it's less in uh, its uh, severity. So you don't get taken down as long. I think I've missed one workout in two years from a little head cold or something. And Hofthor was saying it's been, he can't even remember the last time he had a cold. And when you optimize uh, vitamin D and nutrition and sleep, that's what happens. Your immune system becomes bulletproof. One of the great benefits of that. Next one is sleep apnea. Almost everybody I come across in the powerlifting business or strongman or even bodybuilding have thicker necks. And sleep apnea is relative to neck girth. And that's what crowds the airway and can uh, cause sleep apnea. If you're snoring at night or you're waking up tired, chances are pretty good for athletes like us who train heavy and hard and have extra weight and body mass and muscle, that you're suffering from at least some degree of sleep apnea and this can drastically affect your sleep and performance. And so one of the first things we, we try and do is address that. And uh, another big benefit of, of uh, addressing sleep apnea and sleep issues is that it's the number one thing that prevents heart attacks and it's the number one uh, cause uh, for people who are susceptible to heart attacks is sleep apnea holding your breath at night elevates your blood pressure and creates an environment to where uh, heart attacks are more likely. So I recommend a CPAP. And I know that uh, sometimes when I get into countries who have socialized medicine, it's harder to get an appointment uh, with a doctor, to get uh, a, a sleep test, and to get a CPAP prescribed. They're expensive. Um, in the States, what I've been recommending, and, and if you've got a friend in the States or if you need to reach out to me, we just go on to Craigslist and I found CPAPs for 200 bucks. And just buy it and start using it right away. They're, they're not highly scientific. The CPAPs today are auto set, so they interpret your breathing and give you the air that you need. It's, it's not something that you need a doctor to mess with. They hate when I say this, but the fact of the matter is, is that the medical lobbyists in, in our country uh, have made it really difficult for people to get these things without going through a doctor or a medical supply company, which drastically increases the cost. The CPAP that I bought for me and for my stepson was $2,000 a piece. So with taxes and masks, I was in almost five grand. It was like buying a car. I had to sign a, a, a lease for two and a half years and pay monthly on, for getting CPAPs that are available on, on Craigslist for 200 bucks. 
And I think it's, it's just criminal that, that people don't have access to these. So if you think you're experiencing, and I talk about, I spend a lot of time talking about this because it's the most important thing you can do for performance right now is improve your sleep. It's a breathing apparatus that you put, if you're, if you're snoring at night, if your wife says or girlfriend says you're snoring, if you don't know, or if you wake up with a sore throat or you wake up tired, you're probably experiencing sleep apnea. It's a high likelihood for guys like us who, who train and lift. So I encourage these. I, I'm adamant about it. One of the things that I do as a trainer is, is not to try and be a, a brainiac. I try and be your mom. And I, I start nagging at people. And I, I tell them, where's your CPAP? Where's your CPAP? And if, if I can't get compliance, then I'll ask their girlfriend, hey, is he wearing a CPAP? And I try and find out. And I pay a lot of attention to this because it's a lot more important to me than their training. Hugely important. So I'll spend more time worrying about these things. So you get a CPAP and you put it on at night and it's a 99.9% .9 cure for sleep apnea. You wake up the next morning and your life has changed. And I don't say that about very many things. I'm not a big supplement guy. I don't wave my arms about creatine. But when you wear a CPAP, and I experienced this myself, I started using one back in the mid-90s when I first got, started getting really heavy, 240, 250, 260. Um, that always increases apnea problems the heavier you get. And I did the same thing in the mid-90s. I found a used one and started using it myself before I could get a doctor to work through and get a sleep study and all that stuff. I've done this for so long with so many different doctors because I experiment behind the scenes working with different professionals that I know it's pretty simple. You know, you buy it, you plug it in, you put it on. And the next morning you wake up and you want to clean your gutters and wash your car and mow your lawn. You just feel like you got all this energy and it, it's fantastic. And in the absence of it, you start to realize just how tired you are or were uh, that you might not even recognize as much now. So on to the next thing you hear me rave about, and that's sodium. And uh, there's a great article on the, in the, uh, on the internet called Sodium, Your Secret Weapon. And it's one of my favorite articles that talks about how beneficial sodium is. We calculate calories, we calculate macros, uh, we religiously figure out how many scoops of a protein powder or a creatine that we're going to take. But how much attention do we pay to one of the most beneficial performance enhancing uh, uh, micronutrients on the, available and that's sodium. Do you know how much you take in? Are you paying attention to whether or not you're getting adequate sodium in your diet? What I found is is that people who try and eat clean, they start cutting out uh, pizzas and processed foods, which is a good thing, end up eating foods that are low in sodium. Chicken breast, you know, just eggs, it's a little bit of sodium but not enough for an athlete. Salt has a, a ton of great benefits. I'll go through a few here, I think. What does it do for you? Increases performance, increases stamina, increases endurance. When you go to the gym and you hit a wall 20-30 minutes into a workout, that's sodium depletion. That's not carbs. I promise you, it's not carbs. It's sodium depletion. It's, a, it's a, uh, the single most important thing you can do to increase stamina and endurance at the gym. Also, when you're out of the gym, it's the best thing you can do for recovery. Salt increases blood volume. Now, if you're low in salt, your blood volume decreases. Think thickens. Now, how does that, how do you get oxygen? How is it filtered? Think honey through a filter. You know, it, it, when you're salt deficient, it affects everything from how efficiently it, it uh, filters through your body and gets toxins out of your system to how much oxygen it delivers to the cells that need it. Uh, so it's important to keep that salt adequate. At one of the biggest performance enhancing, I get more emails and comments and messages on the sodium rant I did uh, on Rhino's Rants in terms of improved performance benefits. People saying they got 20 kilo PRs within a week of starting to implement salt usage. There is a small percentage of the population who's salt sensitive and will respond with higher blood pressure. And those folks, like people who have peanut allergies or lactose allergies, can eat peanuts or milk, uh, those folks have to be a little more cautious about how much sodium they use. Usually when you start using sodium or salting all your meals, folks will gain a little bit of water weight for the first few days until your body starts recognizing, hey, I'm not a deficiency anymore, I don't have to hold on to this. And then it'll start regularly processing salt and it'll normalize. So within a week, you're, you're back to normal, uh, any blood pressure increase you may have realized initially in the first day or two will dissipate unless you have a, an intolerance to sodium and it'll become highly effective for you. So just like you measure your macros and you get in how many grams of protein and how many grams of carbs and fats, try and look to adding sodium to your diet. Um, 
and it can be just salting your meals throughout the day. I'm not sure if I've got a slide for this. Uh, I think a little later when I talk about water, we'll, we'll cover that. Um, what kind of salt do you use? People talk about you know, table salt as opposed to um, you know, mineral salts uh, from uh, say Himalayan or sea salts. One of the things that's important when you get salt in is iodine. Iodine is strongly stimulative of the thyroid, which directly impacts metabolism. Iodine also is a huge benefit for your immune system. And so I recommend getting iodized salt, like an iodized table salt. The CDC in the States added iodized salt in the 1920s to, um, added iodine to table salt in the 1920s and drastically impacted uh, goiter, which is a huge problem with iodine deficiency. You start getting goiter, which is a thyroid malfunction. So iodine is just as important as sodium. And iodine can have huge benefits, like I mentioned, with respect to the immune system. Iodine, a lot of people are exposed to fluoride, chlorine, bromide from breads. Um, those things have, they'll lodge into the same receptor sites as iodine and do bad things, toxins, okay? Iodine will displace those and flush them, they'll be flushed out of your system as a result because iodine will occupy the receptor sites that it's supposed to. Uh, so iodine's a huge thing. It'll be great for your metabolism, great for your energy. Uh, and so I recommend using an iodized salt. Now, a lot of folks don't like getting table salt because it's uh, been bleached. It might have caking agents in it. And that's fine. You can find an iodized salt that uh, uh, is, uh, say, of a kosher variety or um, a Himalayan salt that has iodine in it. Uh, but I, I choose to find some food sources if possible. I just mentioned it impacts thyroid function, impacts metabolism as a result. Interesting thing about iodine and sodium is it stimulates the liver. 70% of thyroid conversion from T4 to T3 occurs in the liver. So now we're talking metabolism. We're talking about a, a, a downrange effect on all of your hormones. It's how important that it is that you get in iodine daily and salt. Uh, it acts as, the liver is kind of your detox. People talk about detoxes in terms of juicing, etc., completely worthless. The only thing you can do is optimize your own system's mechanisms for uh, efficiently handling toxins, which is your liver and your kidneys. That's why I'm, I mentioned increasing blood volume benefits your kidney filtration. Um, using iodine uh, benefits your liver, which improves filtration of toxins as well. Um, and also, when people take thyroid, what are they taking? Try iodothyronin, which is, I misspelled, <laughs> but iodine, that's one of the components of, of T3, try iodothyronin. That's why iodine is so important, because it, it's part of your thyroid function. And that takes us to water. I purposely put salt first, because we have this misconception as we carry around our gallon jug of water and we drink it all day long, that that's of primary importance, and it's not. Turns out that the minerals are a lot more important. Here's another expert who I rely on for information, Dr. Sandra Godick. She's PhD of exercise phys, director of, director of the Heat Institute, specializing in thermoregulation, hydration, and electrolyte replacement. I think she knows what she's talking about. Okay, so here's what she says. This whole eight glasses a day of water, it's bullshit, complete myth. She says, drink when you're thirsty. It's more important that you have the minerals and electrolytes. Drink when you're thirsty, she says. Your decrease in performance happens when you're low in minerals and electrolytes, when you're low in sodium, potassium, magnesium, zinc, those kinds of things. And so she says, drink when you're thirsty. Most people have performance problems when they start getting uh, low in salt because you sweat out salt. And some people sweat out more salt than others. So while you're training, you're losing sodium. It's like you're losing carbohydrates and you're losing water as well. Those are the things you want to replace. Salt drinks, here's the thing. To get an effective dose of sodium, like with Gatorade, they put salt in there. It's not enough because if it were, it, would be, it wouldn't be palatable. Now, I still put salt tablets in my water, but it's not the most effective way to get what we call a, a, an effective dose. You know, a lot of companies will tell you uh, supplement companies will uh, pixie dust their products with a little tiny bit of a supplement that's not even an effective dose to cause any benefit but say it's in there 
That's the way I feel about something like Gatorade, which might be better than nothing or better than water, but it's not optimal because you wouldn't be able to drink it if it had enough salt in it. It just wouldn't be palatable. And a lot of people think that, that when they drink tons of water and they're peeing clear, they're healthy. As a matter of fact, they're not. That's not a good thing. You want to have minerals and electrolytes and vitamins in your system. And when the water's flushing them all out, now you, you don't have them anymore. They're not there to benefit you and your performance. And these things start to happen. Obviously, we know about cramping, but you can get headaches, insomnia. Low sodium can affect sleep negatively. And then brain fog when you're up during the day and you get that sensation in your head, that brain fog. So that moves us on to protein. Uh, I should mention, with respect to if you're not getting enough salt, if adding salt to water doesn't provide you enough, how, how, what does? Adding it to food. Put salt on your food, salt your meals throughout the day. And at least start to try and keep track of how much salt you're taking in. I'm not sure if I mention it later in, in the slideshow or not, I just threw it together this week. But what's an optimal amount if you're going to measure how much salt you get in a day? The research suggests that anything between 3 grams and 6 grams is very healthy and they don't see any negative side effects from that. Anything over seven grams can potentially be harmful for a sedentary person. Anything under three grams is even worse than over seven grams. Sodium deficiency causes more problems than sodium excess. So three to six is a sedentary individual, and now you're exercising, working out, uh, and burning a lot of uh, water and, and, and nutrients, uh, sodium, then you need to replace a little more. And I look at about eight grams per gallon of water that you take in, or uh, remember, it's not just about drinking water. There's water associated with your food. And I, I consume a lot of rice in a day, a lot of chicken stock, fruit. Those things give you a lot of water. So I'm not saying you have to drink a gallon of water. But if you're drinking a half gallon of water and eating wet foods throughout the day, uh, I think eight grams is a good number to shoot for. We've seen, uh, like in the cosmonaut studies in Russia, they uh, followed, um, I think it was 300 uh, cosmonauts for more than a year who consumed 12 grams of sodium a day. They put some of them on eight grams uh, and some of them on four grams. And here's an interesting thing uh, to consider, and I, I don't know the answers to all this, I'm just telling you what the research is out there. They had three groups, one took in four grams of sodium a day, one took in eight grams of sodium a day, one took in 12 grams of sodium a day. They were all given the same amount of water. The higher sodium group had more urine. They were measuring how much water they took in, how much water they peed out. The 12 gram of sodium group had more urine. Well, how does that happen? Think camel, fat in the hump, broken down, water extracted, used for its necessary purposes. That's what happens uh, in humans as well. And they did a rat study to follow this up and found the same thing. Increases your metabolism and will break down uh, actually muscle and fat for water unless you are getting adequate protein, exercising, uh, stimulating the right hormones, and then you'll have less muscle tissue breakdown, more fat breakdown. Sodium is something I incorporate pretty aggressively in people who are dieting as well because of that reason. It increases your metabolism. You find out that you have more energy. Uh, you are hungrier, but if you can manage the hunger, you'll burn more calories and lose more fat. And so that's just something to consider that with respect to sodium and what it does. Well, on a protein, everybody wants to know, you know, how much protein should I eat? Um, here's a guy who, uh, I don't know if any of you follow Greg Knuckles stuff on, uh, on the internet, but he recommended an article here. Here's a PhD candidate that uh, is working on muscle metabolism and has some great research uh, called Perfecting Protein Intake in Athletes. And he talked about, here's Greg Knuckles, Stronger by Science is his stuff here. And it, I, again, it's just awesome that we've got people with, that, are, that are so smart that are involved in this industry now giving us the science behind things that, that you know, we've stumbled into over the years that we know works. Uh, how much protein, what kind, when, uh, and this article kind of went into the, the depths of that. It concluded that one gram of protein per pound of body weight is plenty. That's uh, two grams per kilo is plenty of protein. And you probably don't need any more than that to, and you can even use less and still be adequate. Um, but what's important is, is how much per meal. And he talked about uh, getting 20 grams of protein per meal gives you about 90% of the muscle protein synthesis 
that you can possibly stimulate. So for most folks, that's enough, 20 grams a meal. But if you jump it up to 40 grams a meal, you're gonna get the other 10%. And so obviously that's what I recommend. 40 grams of protein a meal is optimal. I don't like to eat less because I don't want to inhibit uh, muscle tissue repair and building. And I don't necessarily like to eat more because it tends to slow metabolism and it fills my body with calories that I could probably consume elsewhere that might give me a greater benefit. And we'll talk about that in a bit. It says that older athletes need more. Uh, I still stick at 40 grams a day. I seem to do fine on that. But um, as you age, you, you don't absorb protein as efficiently. And so you may need to take a little more. Yeah, absolutely. All this is relative to how many calories you burn and, and whether or not you're, you're working out and breaking down muscle tissue. But it's not that different, to be so honest. Yeah, possibly. I, I think some of the research that says the older people need it, uh, need more of it is because they're not stim they don't have as much muscle tissue, not stimulating muscle protein synthesis as much. Uh, so that's an, another thing is it doesn't really matter what you, it's not as important what you eat, it's more important what your body can utilize and assimilate. And that's affected by the stimulus that you apply, meaning training in particular. When you work out, uh, muscle protein synthesis is elevated. Same thing's true when I talk about these 10 minute walks, it increases your insulin sensitivity and so now uh, you can utilize those calories better. So what your actions are dictate what uh, kind of how many calories you need and what kind and how they're utilized. Um, he focuses on this pre-sleep protein, says this is pretty important. Just try and get that 40 grams right before bed and that can help keep uh, protein metabolism elevated throughout the night while you're sleeping. Uh, and it's a recommendation, particularly for athletes who uh, might otherwise be deficient at night. And I know there's a lot of talk about now about the, uh, the fasted, um, the intermittent fasting and that. And I, that's fine for some conditions, as is keto for some conditions. Uh, there's cases in which I recommend those diets. But for an athlete who's training hard and long and getting ready to compete, um, I don't want to have long windows of, of, of fasting as I'm concerned that they're not going to get all the nutrients that they need, particularly for someone, uh, you know, that's in the heavyweight class trying to, you know, lift and gain a lot of muscle size. And then meal frequency, and then he recommends that four plus meals a day, you get protein about every few hours, four hours, five hours at, at, at the worst. Um, the important thing there is, is there's no mechanism within the body to store protein. You can only utilize what you've eaten and what is readily available in the bloodstream. And so you do want to get protein in uh, at frequent intervals throughout the day. Uh, I, I tend to try and get in five meals. When I was training, I was getting in, for bodybuilding, I was getting in as many as eight meals a day. I'd start eating at five in the morning and uh, finish at 11 o'clock at night. He mentioned another thing that I haven't tried yet, but it seems pretty compelling when you read the research because he talks about amino acids a lot. And he found a significant spike in muscle protein synthesis from using leucine. Not branch chains, not leucine, isoleucine, and valine, but just leucine uh, by itself. About 15, 30 minutes before a meal. Then when you ate the meal, the muscle protein synthesis uh, drastically increased. So I'm just tossing it out there as something that might be worth trying. As for BCAAs, he said they're relatively ineffective, particularly for people who are getting adequate protein. We found the same thing in terms of glutamine. Uh, it's the most abundant protein in the body. So if you're getting adequate protein, these things are, are pretty ineffective. Somebody who's on a significantly restricted caloric diet and low protein may see some benefit from um, supplementing these. So in terms of saving your money and directing it towards something that might be more effective, this is one of those areas where, uh, having said that, uh, folks that don't like just drinking regular water and might want to flavor it, they tend to put in BCAAs uh, or in a mineral electrolyte tablet because it tastes better and it'll help them drink a little more water during the day. That moves us on to fats. Fats are hugely important. Uh, all of the vitamins A, D, E, and K, your fat soluble vitamins, of course, are in there and those are hugely important, those micronutrients for performance and recovery. Um, and so I don't restrict fats. I don't believe in the, a low fat program. They've actually shown that the higher the fats, the lower uh, the body fat, the lower, more fat that you lose in many, many uh, studies. So I try and focus on getting a decent amount of fats in. And I use cholesterol-based animal proteins um, 
I think that the American Dietary Association just came out in 2015 and said that there's no upper limit to the amount of uh, cholesterol that you can consume. It doesn't, it doesn't have any effect. Your, your liver determines how much you need and can convert it. Again, like sodium uh, uh, sensitive people, cholesterol is more genetic. Whether or not you have an elevated cholesterol problem seems to be more genetic. And for the vast majority of people who don't have that issue, eating cholesterol does not increase cholesterol in the bloodstream. And cholesterol has a lot of benefits. I mean, it's, uh, it's what's used to manufacture hormones in the body. So it's hugely effective to, to use those kinds of proteins. Uh, just a little note that I put in here, because some people like to eat egg whites. Always throw a yolk in with those. The problem with, um, even with vegetables, is, is that when you start to get those vitamins in your system, if you don't have a fatty uh, courier, if you don't have some sort of fat to take them to the cells, every cell in the body is surrounded by a fatty membrane and you need fats to penetrate that and to take those vitamins and minerals into the cell. So I don't believe in separating it. I'm always confused how people take God's foods, split them up and recombine and add them and think they're improving things. It, it never happens that way. Eating whole foods in, in their most original form is always better. Um, primarily because a lot of these foods come with cofactors that help you digest these foods better and utilize the nutrients and prevent excesses. When you take a multivitamin, it's very easy to build up an excess. Uh, and a lot of times those multivitamins aren't of the form that your body can utilize. And when you eat the uh, quality foods, they're in the for highly, what we call a highly biological available form, and you use more of those nutrients. Brings us to red meat, which uh, everybody knows my steak and rice diet. You know, I'm, I'm big on eating red meat and lots of red meat. Uh, red meat is probably, you know, everybody talks about these, uh, um, all these wonder foods or uh, red meat's probably the only food that is a wonder food. It has everything in it. You can live on it exclusively. You don't need anything else. Everything's in there. And not just survive, but thrive on just red meat. So if there's one thing that, that you should have as the core of your nutrition program, not just for macros, not just for protein, but for micros, it's the most micronutrient dense food that you can possibly eat and it has the most variety. <clears throat> Heme iron is a highly biological available source of iron. It's hugely important uh, is in red meat. B vitamins is a monster. B vitamins are what helps you metabolize food into energy. And uh, red meat is high in B vitamins. And it's one of the things that, that, that uh, a lot of people will supplement, but it's not in the right form. And it's got a wide variety of B vitamins. Obviously zinc, magnesium, uh, creatine is in red meat. I've found that athletes who don't eat any red meat tend to get uh, some benefit from taking creatine. And athletes who eat enough red meat and enough salt tend not to get very much benefit from creatine. I never got much benefit because I ate plenty of salt and I ate plenty of red meat. So creatine never did anything for me. Maybe caused some cramping, it was just my experience. But people who had, who just ate egg whites and chicken breast and some veggies and were low in sodium, creatine causes uh, some water retention, some cellular retention, which uh, most folks tend to believe that that's really why you get uh, uh, a strength result from creatine. It's just because of the intracellular water retention, which you could get from sodium intracellularly. This brings us to processed vegetable oils, which I misspelled. Don't spell it that way. Uh, these are poison. This is your, you can't even read that, but it's your canola oil, your corn oil, uh, these processed vegetable oils loaded with omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, these things are uh, oxidized very easily, which creates um, toxins in the system, you know, free radicals. That all happens from these vegetable oils. They're unstable and they're a horrible source uh, of food and even their structure. They're high in omega-6 fatty acid. Uh, and instead what I use is animal proteins uh, and vegetables and I prefer to use omega eggs or line caught fish or um, you know obviously red meat. The reason being is is that when uh, you eat eggs and chicken or um, uh, farmed fish, it's higher in polyunsaturated fatty acids than fresh. 
And polyunsaturated fatty acids are not as efficient for your body to utilize as energy. Again, because of the oxidation and now you've got free radicals and inflammation. Um, and uh, again, butter. People always ask me, how do I grease my pan or what kind of oil do I use? Particularly if you're eating a lot of vegetables, you're going to want a fatty source with those vegetables because there's no way to get those vitamins into the system without some sort of fatty source. So now, more recently, people are saying, you know, throw butter or oil, olive oil, on your uh, vegetables because the cold pressed oils are okay. Extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, those things aren't uh, chemically processed with uh, hexane, which is a, uh, a gas, really. And then I try and get my fats out of my whole food sources. I don't need to add a whole bunch of fats in because they're in there. And I use things like steak, salmon, and eggs. And I should mention, with respect to red meat, um, lamb is red meat, high in myoglobin. So uh, that's a, a source that might be more affordable here. And I would highly recommend that you use that. One of the things we did with uh, uh, Hofdor's diet, I just go on to say here that all these vegetable oils, they're in everything. I can't go to restaurants because I tend, I have an allergy to vegetable oils. It, it just causes major digestion problems, wreaks havoc on my stomach. And I end up racing to the bathroom. I know when I've got vegetable oil in my food because within 30 minutes, I'm just full speed headed to the bathroom. Uh, they use it in everything. You'll see this stuff everywhere. I was surprised to see when I went to Whole Foods Market and looked at all of their uh, hot prepared foods, almost everything has canola oil in it. They put it in bread, it's used to cook your eggs in restaurants, it's used to cook your, uh, all of your food, your flat iron steaks are soaked in uh, canola oil. It's in everything, it's hard to avoid, that's why I don't eat at restaurants very often and if I do it's got to be flame grilled food and I specifically tell them I'm allergic to those oils. Uh, here's a great reference on the internet. There's uh, Ray Peet, and I always will put in Ray Peet clips. And it's just all of these one, two, three, four minute little clips of him talking about uh, many of these things, such as polyunsaturated fats and how horrible they are for your body and for the system, and how consuming them increases all cause mortality. The oil industry will try and tell you that they decrease cholesterol and therefore have a positive effect on, on heart disease. But what they don't tell you is that they cause, uh, that you have a higher all-cause mortality when you eat these things and you're fatter as a result. Uh, but Ray Pete's stuff is excellent. And he talks about the vegetable oil effects on the body. Eventually I'll throw in a video or two to share uh, with this. Mary Enig, PhD in nutritional science, published an article on fats and oils. Uh, she's got a great piece called The Oiling of America, which goes back and talks about how we ended up with trans fats, margarine that everybody so uh, eagerly accepted and tried to promote as a result to, to try and reduce using saturated fats. But it was all tied into the oil industry, the canola oil industry out of Canada, Canadian oil, it's not even a food. Canola, it's Canadian oil. Um, but this article here goes into the money that's behind that and the reason why we've been pushed all of these uh, polyunsaturated fats and told that they're healthy and they're not. I would never, uh, the first thing I do is go into a diet, an athlete's diet and pull all of these out and tell them not to eat foods that are high in these polyunsaturated fats and oils. Brings us to carbs. Now, when I train an athlete, I, I adjust carbs based on their needs. And I use them to fuel workouts and to protect muscle tissue from being used as energy. Carbs are highly protective of muscle tissue. Uh, so I'll use those for people who have a high workload. Now, if somebody's um, experiencing uh, say pre-diabetic situation where their uh, hemoglobin A1C is elevated and their blood tests show that, that they're having a hard time with insulin sensitivity. I'll reduce carbs for a period of time, incorporate exercise uh, to try and you know fix that problem first. And a lot of the problem with some of these carbohydrates that people eat is they bring a lot of baggage with them. We'll talk more about that as we go through this, uh, this slide. Some carbs that you utilize in your diet uh, are easier to digest and utilize than other carbohydrates. And so we'll want to pick the right ones. When I'm doing weight loss programs, I tend to lower carbohydrates. When I'm doing weight gain programs, I tend to raise them. And when I say weight gain, I mean muscle performance. I uh, never try and encourage gaining fat. So I limit carbs for weight loss, I increase carbs for weight gain. It's a huge component of my vertical axis for people to grow on, but I use a particular type of carbohydrate. So what I do, when I do a low carb diet, I still include 
uh, fruit, a small amount of fructose in the diet. And people hear fructose and they start to freak out. And I go, fructose, you know, soda pop, high fructose corn syrup, uh, you know, obesity, insulin resistance, all the you know, metabolic issues that come with that. The problem is, is that fructose powerfully stimulates the liver. That's where it's digested. That's where it's, it's pulled into very quickly and utilized. And the liver loves it. And when the liver's happy, it be, it's the chemist of the body. It becomes better at processing toxins. It becomes better at, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of thyroid conversion from T4 to T3. Keeping a liver happy is important. And I've been getting blood tests every month for over 12 years. I've probably spent 50 grand on blood tests in the last 12 years. And I, I monitor these things. I monitor my liver enzymes, my AST, ALT. And that tells you whether or not your liver's healthy. And I know from having competed in the past when you're using an, an oral performance enhancing drug that drastically affects your liver. Your liver enzymes start to elevate and you lose your appetite as a result because your liver says, stop feeding me, there's too many toxins in here. So if people are having trouble with, with, um, uh, with their appetite, I try and, and help their liver stay healthy. Now, the, the downside of that is too much fructose, like if you're drinking a six pack of, of soda every day with high fructose corn syrup, your liver loves it so much, it'll take it all in, convert it to fat and hold it. It can only hold 75 to 100 grams of fructose a day as glycogen. It converts it to glycogen and stores it there. And so I never recommend more than say 50 grams a day, but I put it into these small 10 or 12 gram doses about three times a day. And my favorite way to get it in is just orange juice. I'll drink three ounces, just a tiny little bit of orange juice, three or four times a day. And I've noticed on my blood tests that I, when I do that, my liver enzymes come down. And I notice that my appetite improves as a result, but I'm not taking in so much that I'm creating any of the, the fatty liver problems. Uh, so it stimulates liver. Uh, you can use it pre or post workout. When on low carb intake, I try and time my carbs for pre and post workout. And I don't know how huge a deal that is, but it tends to give you a little more energy for your training so you don't have to use stimulants. When I'm doing high carb intake, uh, I use easy to digest carbs, such as white rice and again, some fruits to stimulate the liver. It's also been shown uh, that when you take in two types of, of carbohydrate sources, one from fructose and one from say dextrose or, or uh, another carbohydrate source, that your body will absorb more of it faster. And so that's why people will put in these um, cyclic uh, dextrose products where they put in multiple carb sources in their post-workout shakes. And this is uh, one of the ways that, that I help athletes eat enough calories to fuel their workload and their muscle mass and grow is to use the extra carbohydrates. And here's some of uh, the carbs that I use to build a foundation, what I call the horizontal platform of my diet, because I want to get in all the micronutrients. That's really important. I talked to you about measuring or at least paying attention to sodium, measuring or at least paying attention to iodine to make sure you get it in every day. So now here's some of the foods that can contribute to that. Uh, in Hawthorne's diet, I make sure that he got in carrots every day, gets in some sort of vegetable. I like to throw in sweet potatoes because it's a root tuber, as is carrots. Now this whole prebiotic, probiotic science that's going on right now is extremely complex. Nobody really knows what they're talking about. Uh, everything is really kind of a guess. It'll be 10 years of probably before we have enough information, if ever, to make any real significant uh, and I think uh, suggestions or, or recommendations about prebiotics, probiotics, and your gut biome. That's a name that's been thrown around now that everybody's focused on is gut biome. There's a hundred trillion bacteria in your gut biome. Your, um, the likelihood that you can affect that, it, 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 people used to think that it could change weekly or daily, but now we're seeing that it can change by the minute, your gut biome. So, I, while I say that I'll eat certain foods to try and improve my gut biome, uh, really what I'm talking about is, is trying to make sure that my digestion feels good, that when I'm eating, the foods uh, don't aggravate my stomach, they don't cause gas and bloating, uh, so that I can uh, digest my food quicker, more efficiently, I'm not on the toilet all the time, and then I can eat more of the kinds of foods that I think I grow from. So this is the micronutrient profile that I like to see. I bring in a potato, a sweet potato, again, a prebiotic, it's supposed to stimulate uh, the uh, bacteria and the digestive enzymes in the body. So we eat a daily carrot, I eat a small sweet potato. The problem with a lot of the foods that I put in my horizontal diet is that they have some benefit up to a point and then trying to eat too much of them can bring detrimental effects. Uh, they, 
There might be resistant starches in by eating a lot of potatoes, in which case you start getting gas and bloating and, and the like. So I use just enough to try and get my micronutrient profile complete, but I don't build uh, the, the bulk of my calories on these items. I wouldn't eat 10 potatoes a day or 10 carrots a day. I just have one carrot a day. I have one sweet potato a day. I'll throw in some, maybe some peppers or spinach because they tend to be low gas. You don't get a lot of methane buildup from eating those. Uh, I use the FODMAP. Uh, and we'll talk about it here in a minute. It's, it's a list of foods that are, that are more likely and less likely to cause gas and bloating and IBS and indigestion problems. I focus a lot of my diet on that. Most of the athletes I talk to, that's one of the first things I do is ask them, how's your digestion? Um, uh, you know, like Mark Bell says in his, uh, in his podcast sometimes, he says, may your shits always be tapered. And there's some science to that. And you want to pay attention to those kinds of things because your regularity and the quality of, uh, of your shits is important. And I know this, I got a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and I know what, from what I feed them, I know what's gonna happen. And I gotta clean that up. And so I'm really careful about what I feed them or have fed them in the past and feed them now. And I, I, I try and uh, you know, monitor that with myself and my athletes too. I ask them those questions. So it can be kind of personal if you're working with me. <laughs> so, now we get to some of the differences here, why I use you know, steak and rice, you always see me using white rice. And that's because it's very easy to digest and it, I can eat it in large quantities. Other foods like wheat, oats, potatoes, like I mentioned, they bring baggage with them. They have a lot of anti-nutrients, phytic acid, lectins, things that cause a lot of gas and bloating, things that your body doesn't digest things that are indigestible, that make their way into the intestines and then the bacteria that breaks them down doesn't really break them down, it converts them into methane. And that makes you uncomfortable and it, uh, it starts to affect your diet. So I use a lot of white rice and that's, white rice isn't terribly nutrient dense, but that's not what I'm using it for. I'm using it for the macros, I'm not using it for the micros and I wanna be able to take a lot of it in to fuel a big appetite. If I've gotta take in 5,000 calories a day, and I try and take in a whole ton of brown rice, then my gut's just gonna be exploded. It's gonna be terrible. Same thing happens with oats. Oats tend not to be able to, to and it's dose dependent. Uh, you can have a cup, but if you try and get the bulk of your uh, carbohydrates for your day out of oats, then you're gonna start to get massive problems with gas. One way you can remedy some of these problems, like when people eat legumes, which are loaded with lectins, is they soak them overnight, and that's beans, by the way. And I don't recommend burritos to my uh, athletes because the beans are hard to digest. And my athletes who need a lot of calories uh, aren't gonna be able to eat six burritos. And so I try and keep their stomachs happy and healthy. And so, uh, but if oatmeal is something that you enjoy or have a lot of access to, uh, one of the ways to remedy that is you soak your oatmeal overnight. Put it out on the table, put some warm water in it, and put a couple tablespoons of yogurt in it. And that'll help ferment it. It'll help pre-digest it. So when you wake up in the morning and you cook that oatmeal and eat it, you probably won't get bloated. Having said that, I still prefer white rice for the majority of the calories that I pack into a, a vertical axis of this diet because uh, I don't have to worry about somebody's reaction to lots of oats. I talked about the FODMAP, one word, FODMAP, and you can Google that and, uh, on the internet. Do you have a question? Shoot. Same problem. You, you, when you eat a lot of it, you start to notice that it's hard on the stomach. And so quinoa is great, it's loaded, it's got a good protein source, it's got good vitamins and minerals, it's great. But it's, it's not magic, there is baggage that comes with it in quantity, so it's dose dependent. Yeah, and that's the thing. The reason that I have the carrots in there and the, uh, the uh, spinach, which is low gas but still has fiber. Carrots tends to be well uh, tolerated by the gut but still has fiber. Um, fiber is not always a good thing. Too much fiber can start to wreak havoc. It impedes protein absorption. It uh, binds to valuable minerals and electrolytes. Think sodium, potassium, you know, zinc, magnesium. Too many uh, uh, too much fiber can shuttle those, all those things out of the system. It grabs a hold of them and takes them out. Uh, but there's some benefit to those fibers because they also take toxins out of the system. When your kidney and liver process those toxins and uh, they need something to attach them to to get them out of the system so they're not reabsorbed and they just keep circulating through your bloodstream. So I do include some fiber. 
There's a lot more foods in my steak and rice diet that, that uh, you, you're starting to discover, and there's reasons for them in terms of the macronutrient foundation. And these are some of the reasons, the, the fiber for toxins uh, to help with digestion. I find that a lot of, historically, a lot of people would take in just a ton of like uh, egg whites and broccoli, and broccoli is really hard to digest. It comes with, a, if you aren't cooking that really, really, really well, so it's soft with a fork to push through it to break down some of those uh, anti-nutrients so that your, your stomach can digest it without creating all that methane. So I'm cautious about which food I eat and that brings me to the FODMAP. The FODMAP kind of defines foods by hard to digest and easy to digest. And I use that as a reference. It's not magic, but it starts you thinking about how does a food feel on me? I told Hofthor last night we were talking, he's like, don't you eat this, don't you eat that? And I'm like, look, I don't choose foods based on how much I like them. I choose them based on how much they like me. And I make that decision about an after hour after I eat. I decide whether or not the food I ate was a good choice. And that's kind of how I've come to this, um, these food items that I've selected. And they tend to be consistent with this FODMAP, which shows a lot of alternatives. So it doesn't have to be specifically what I eat. Sometimes people can't eat those things. Uh, we mentioned earlier with respect to cholesterol, it's, it's not uh, defined like it used to be when uh, our government came out with trans fats to try and avoid cholesterol. Um, there's really no indication that unless you're sensitive to cholesterol that you're eating cholesterol is gonna cause heart disease and it's important for uh, uh, hormones in the body. Moves us on to caffeine. And caffeine's a good performance enhancer. Uh, I utilize it post-workout with uh, my carbohydrates and my sodium and my water to help uh, intake those nutrients faster. Uh, that's a, uh, one of the bigger benefits that I've realized from it. Problem with caffeine is you attenuate to it, which means that the more you use it, the less results you get. And another problem is, is that in an effective dose for performance, uh, it's like 600 milligrams is really where they found to be an effective dose to actually show a performance improvement. That's a lot of, of caffeine. And that much caffeine, say in a powerlifting competition, uh, can uh, uh, cause the kidneys to release water and you get some, uh, you start to pee more. And now people might get dehydrated if they start pissing a lot uh, at competitions. I don't know what this is, but it looked good at the time, I suppose. Uh, caffeine, yeah, it doesn't have any extra calories. Uh, you wanna, don't want to take it too late at night so it doesn't interrupt sleep. Um, and I prefer, like people ask me about, do you use a pre-workout? And I don't. And there's a few reasons for that is because I get adequate uh, food throughout the day, carbohydrate sources. I eat a meal two hours before I train and I get plenty of sodium. And sodium provides me all the energy, the stamina and endurance. People who hit a wall are sodium deficient and they'll take caffeine to try and compensate for that and just end up digging a deeper and deeper hole. And so I don't want to use pre-workouts. Another thing about pre-workouts is what um, Mikhail Kokolev told me one time is that when you get to the platform, you want to be able to have the ability, have trained yourself to capture, uh, to draw in and, and, and get your adrenaline and get uh, psyched for your lift. If you do it artificially with some sort of pre-workout or caffeine or something that stimulates you, then you lose the ability from not having trained yourself to, to grab that, that adrenaline. You lose the ability to do that and you can't time it very well. You're just kind of jittery the, through the whole workout, which isn't good. You want to be able to amp yourself up and then relax. And then for your next event, amp yourself up and then relax. On caffeine, you can't do that. You stay, you stay amped up the whole time and that cortisol is releasing because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And when you start pumping your body full of caffeine and your body starts putting a lot of cortisol out there to try and slow down that, that uh, adrenaline that's created. Uh, I just take like 100 milligrams uh, post-workout. Some folks will take a little bit before, but uh, I'd prefer to do it with food. And again, the, ca the caffeine can wreak havoc on your adrenals and uh, cause chronically elevated cortisol levels and uh, I just recommend to use it sparingly. Meaning you might use it just on squat day if that's what you wanted to do. But if you use it every day, it's not gonna have any effect on, on a particular day. We'll talk about cardio. The body responds to the stimulate, stimulation, that, uh, the stimulus that you provided. And that means if you're trying to be bigger, stronger, faster, and you go in the gym and do a whole bunch of steady state cardio, uh, you're sending the wrong message and your body doesn't respond accordingly. The only time I recommend steady state cardio is people who distance run. 
And that steady state means you're getting on a treadmill and walking for 40 minutes or jogging for an extended period of time. Sends the wrong message to the body when trying to maintain lean body mass. And here's why. Because your muscle has a high nutrient demand, it's heavy, it has a high oxygen demand, and it has a high water demand. And if you're on a treadmill walking for 40 minutes, your body says, damn, this muscle's heavy. <laughs> it has a high oxygen demand, it has a high nutrient demand, it needs a lot of water. I gotta get rid of this muscle. And that's how your body responds. And I learned this the first year I competed back in 1986, the people who were jogging a lot tended not to be very conditioned. They didn't have a six pack of abs. They tend to carry fat on their obliques. Um, even the women who were jogging five miles a day at the gym I was training at all tended to be fatty. They weren't lean and hard. Uh, there was a great article that, that I send people that, uh, of a, a triathlete, a female triathlete. And there's somebody who swims two miles, jogs 26 miles, bikes 100 miles, was not lean, wasn't defined. Uh, the body holds on to that fat for fuel and it gets rid of the muscle. But when she switched to high intensity training, say CrossFit, her body started to change. Lost the fat, increased the muscle. So your body responds to the stimulus that you provide. And I use that theory when I specialize with an athlete. I use that theory as we get ready for, uh, uh, say a strength competition as opposed to hypertrophy training. And I try and focus, get everything focused towards that direction. Is that why it's so hard to maybe like slim down on a swimmer? Yeah, they need that, that fat for the endurance activity. That's absolutely right. It's a completely different thing. And if that's your sport, that's great. You know, your body will respond to the stimulus you provide. That's great. You look at the, the, the Kenyans that are doing the marathons, their body's perfect for that, you know, but the sprinters, uh, you know, Usain Bolt is just going to be rocked out. So there's a, and you as an athlete want to recognize that whatever stimulus you're providing yourself is how your body's going to respond. And if you're sending it two messages, then it can't ever get great at one thing. And you talk about CrossFit, they're, they're good at everything, but they're not great at any one thing. And that's not to knock CrossFit, that's what their job is, to be good at everything. Like a decathlete, the decathlete never wins the 100 meter dash, you know, the decathlete never wins the shot put, but they can do everything better than anybody else can do, you know, everything. So that takes me to hit under load. So how do you work your cardiovascular system? Because you do want to uh, keep your body fit and make sure that your oxygen, uh, that your body utilizes oxygen well, because it helps uh, with muscle repair uh, and so many other things. So I use hit under load, uh, and that might be uh, I think I've got a couple examples here, whether you're high intensity interval training. <laughs> so it improves cardiovascular benefits while stimulating muscles. I talked when we started off about how everything you do stimulates hormones. When you do HIT training, when you do explosive training and, and weightlifting, you're stimulating all the hormones that result in gaining muscle. And those are, those are the hormones that we want to stimulate, and that's why we do these works. And so I, I use weighted exercises with higher reps, brief rest periods, and supersets. And that's weighted carries. That's why Strongman is such a great uh, you know, training protocol for being both healthy and strong, because they use weighted, loaded exercises through distance, time under tension. And uh, I'll use, say, in bodybuilders, we'll use higher rep stuff. We'll do 20 rep sets of squats, or uh, if we do weighted carries, we'll take maybe a 30 second rest and do another one. Take a 30 second rest, do another one. That's gonna drastically elevate your heart rate without breaking down muscle tissue. So I use these strategically. Running stairs, pushing prowlers, weighted carries. Those are all, uh, the thing I like about stairs as opposed to sprinting um, is that it's all concentric loading. Every time you push on a step, it's concentric. Most of the muscle tissue, as you know, gets broken down on the eccentric load, like on when, you're, when you're going down in a squat or coming down in a bench. That's your eccentric load, and that's where most of the damage occurs. So when you're, doing, when you're not actually weight training, but you're doing a supporting exercise, you don't want to break down a ton of muscle tissue. You want to still be able to recover quickly. So I use stairs or a recumbent bike under a little bit of tension, and I do a 30-second um, sprint with a 30-second rest. 30-second sprint with a 30-second rest. Now I'm stimulating muscle without breaking it down. I'm getting lots of blood in the area, which heals my body, and I'm getting the cardiovascular benefit from that. And it's very brief, it's less than 10 minutes. Uh, I might do 10 30 second sprints with 10 30 second rests, that's 10 minutes, and I'm done. When I was training 
uh, for competitions, I would put a recumbent bike in my house or in my uh, hotel room, depending on where I was training. I did this with Mark Bell for two months. I put a recumbent bike in my extended stay and I would have a big squat day, say on Sunday. On Monday, at least three times throughout that day, I would ride that bike. Wouldn't break down any muscle tissue. I'd stimulate a ton of blood flow. I'd get a good cardiovascular benefit that you don't get from doing two reps on the squat. Uh, so I was able to stay healthy, but still be focused on the event that I was, you know, on strength as my primary goal. And that takes me to the 10 minute walk. Uh, after you eat a meal, I've uh, been pushing these 10 minute walks. And there's a, uh, f because it improves digestion, I think I got a whole list of things here. These 10 minute walks increases insulin sensitivity, decreases gas and bloating. So as soon as you get done eating, you go take a 10 minute walk and it actually helps uh, decrease gas and bloating, improves digestion, decreases delayed onset muscle soreness because you're walking and moving the body and now the blood's flowing and that's how it's healing. If you just lay down all the time, it's, every time you get up, you're sore, you're like, ugh, you're like that. But if you move the body, then lots of blood gets through there. Blood is the life force. It repairs and fixes everything. It brings all the nutrients in, but you have to move. Your heart has a pump. Your heart is a pump that pumps the blood into everywhere in the body. But to get the toxins out, you know, the blood will go in and repair things, but there's, there's toxins as a result, right? To get those out of the system, you need the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. It moves with movement. And so you have to move frequently throughout the day. Um, we see this in people who work in office buildings and stuff and sit at desks all day. If I can get them to stand up for 10 minutes out of every hour, it's the equivalent of jogging 12 marathons a year, just by implementing that one change. Also in these studies, I don't know if I put one up here or not, three 10 minute walks, which is 30 minutes a day, is far better than one 30 minute walk. Japanese ran a huge study where they put um, the pedometers on a group of people and asked them to walk 10,000 steps a day. You, see, you guys have seen those, uh, the Fitbits, is that what they are? And people put those on, or the pedometers, and it measures how many steps a day they take. Then they took another group of people and they asked them to take three 15 minute walks. They walked maybe 4,000 steps but the 15 minute walks were brisk. You actually got your heart rate elevated. You, you know, it wasn't a full on workout, but you had a good arm swing. And they did three 15 minute walks, walked maybe 4,000 steps. They outperformed the 10,000 step group twofold on every measurement. Uh, decrease in blood sugar, increase uh, in, uh, or decrease in body fat and body composition, cardiovascular benefit, all of it was improved. And they walked, they did half as much movement, but they did it more deliberately uh, with more intensity. So the three 10 minute walks are huge. I would replace, for any athlete, I would immediately replace all of your, or any of your steady state stuff with these three. I use these for people who are dieting for shows, like women for bikini, and I use them for athletes who are trying to gain as much weight as possible because they are equally as effective for both based on your calorie intake. So. Very effective. Again, I talked about standing at least 10 minutes every hour. Sitting is a disease. Think about that. When I fly, and I've talked to Hofthor about this, um, or just if I'm working throughout the day, I usually set my phone for a one hour timer. It goes off every hour on the hour. And that reminds me to either get up and move around. When I'm on an airplane, I do take advantage of that. I'll go back and walk to the, back to the bathroom. And I'll stand back there and do this for as long as until the, the flight attendants kick me out and tell me to go back to my seat. And I do that every hour. That's why I always sit on the aisle so I can get up and move around on the plane. Because if you sit there, my flight over here was seven hours. Can you imagine just sitting there for seven hours straight? It, I think it digs a hole, it puts you in a deficit. Sitting is a disease, it causes all kinds of problems. Uh, people always ask me, how many calories do I eat? And usually I design the program first for um, you know, micros and macros, and then how much of those you eat really depends on what your goal is. I ask folks to tell me what they've currently been eating and try and estimate about how many calories they are eating. You can't uh, fine tune a number. Everybody's different. They burn a different amount of calories. Their workload is largely impacts that. So I just estimate and you can do the same thing. You just kind of got to take an estimation. And then one of the reasons that all my programs involve follow up is because I want to be able to check their weight every week or, or even every few days to see are you gaining or losing and then we start throwing more calories into the equation. Here's an interesting thing about how does your body burn calories because people tend to focus on the wrong thing. 
70% of your calories are burned at rest from your basal metabolic rate. That's why it's optimal to increase muscle tissue because you're burning more calories at rest just while you sit there. 15% are burned from daily activities. You call the non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's just walking around, you know, vacuuming, cooking your food, going to the grocery store. 10% are burned from eating. That's your thermic effect of food. And protein has a higher thermic effect than, say, carbs or fat. Um, and then here's the important one. 5% are burned from exercise. Exercise activity thermogenesis. So it tells you how little importance walking on the treadmill is in terms of your total calorie consumption for the day and how much important it is to burn those calories at rest by increasing your metabolism. This is why, why everything you do, how it affects your hormones, affects your uh, rate of calorie consumption. We know if your thyroid's optimal, you're gonna burn a lot more calories and your body temperature is gonna stay elevated more. Uh, and that's the most important thing you can do. So if I had to choose between uh, stimulating the thyroid and doing a whole bunch of cardio, it's an easy choice for me. Because 70% of your body's calories that you burn is directly relative to the health of your liver and your thyroid function. So that's why I do blood tests and find out where your thyroid function is because it dramatically affects in the greatest way. You can do all the treadmill you want twice a day, hour each time, and have very little benefit as compared to just optimizing one of your hormones. More exercise does not equal more fat loss. Solution to that, uh, we increase our basal metabolic rate by lifting weights. So when I implement uh, a weightlifting program, I oftentimes do two-a-days. Just like the three 10-minute walks, some people go into the gym and they'll train for an hour and a half or two hours straight. I'd rather have them train for 40 minutes in the morning and 20 or 30 minutes at night. They're actually working out fewer minutes, but I find that their intensity increases as a result. Uh, and when you match for volume, you'll get a better result from the shorter uh, amount of time. So I do love two-a-day trainings, particularly for hypertrophy training. When it comes to strength uh, training, you may have to, to um, kind of ramp that back a little bit because recovery becomes important. But what I'll do is, is I'll use a hypertrophy training program to develop an elevated uh, uh, level of fitness. Your cardiovascular fitness uh, from having, you know, done more supersets and uh, you know short rest period stuff so that when you start decreasing volume and frequency but increasing weight as you get closer and closer to your competition uh, there's a carryover effect so you can recover faster as you go through that process uh, staying active throughout the day just staying on your feet you're gonna burn a ton more calories than if you just sit down uh, and then the high protein diet again helps and the exercise it's more for people who are just focused on losing body fat, really. Uh, calculating calories, how many? We just talked about that. Everyone's different. Uh, start somewhere near your current calorie intake. Clean up your diet. Did you gain or lose weight? And did your performance and body composition improve? Uh, and those are the things that I ask people along the way to make sure that, that they're eating and training according to their goals. We talked about hormones. Uh, we talked about how salt impacts thyroid and about how too much cardio impacts your metabolism and about how lack of sleep impacts your hormones, um, increasing car uh, cortisol and decreasing testosterone. So we've covered that information. Blood tests is a biggie for me, and I don't know how hard it is to get a blood test here and how expensive it is and how time consuming. It's pretty easy. On my site, I have a link at stanefforting.com called blood test. And if you click on it, it takes you to uh, private MD labs, which in the States we use to get um, uh, the forms we need to go down to a lab and get a blood test without ever having to go to a doctor. And they send you the results directly to your email. On there, I recommend a particular test. And if you go to that test and click the information link, it will list all of the blood tests that they run at Private MD Labs. Your whole profile of all the things that I like to see. Print that out, take it to your doctor, and see if he'll run all of those labs. And then you have access to all that information. And then when I have an athlete do that, then they send me that information. I take a look at it and we decide together how we're gonna improve you know, where their thing deficiencies are at. Uh, talked a little bit about supplements. Big thing for me is that supplements can help, they may help, but they should never replace food. Lots of times for convenience, people will replace a meal with a protein drink and I would never do that. I'm talking about a good, better, best scenario and the stuff I put out for me is always what's best. And if you have to